In this lecture, we're going to look at apportionment methods. So let's begin by reviewing what we mean by apportionment. Now, the example that we're going to use here is the U.S. House of Representatives. According to the Constitution, we're supposed to give seats to the individual states in the United States in proportion to their populations. Now, what we need to do is to determine exactly how we do that. We must say how many representatives each state will have. We must determine the apportionment. Now, that might sound like it's a total triviality. If you're supposed to give something out in proportion, then why don't you just do it? Well, the problem is, of course, you can't give fractions of representatives, and you can't divide representatives between states. So there actually are some mathematical issues here to be faced. Now, we're going to look at various ways of solving this problem. We will call them apportionment methods. And right here, we're looking at the gentleman for whom various of these methods are named. You look at these and you say, well, wait, those are people I know. Those are famous figures in American history. Indeed, they are. Let's discuss them uh, one at a time. Let's begin at top left. And we're going to look at his method first. This is Alexander Hamilton. He was the first Secretary of the Treasury. He was from the state of New York. He was an advocate of the idea that the United States should become a great financial and commercial power. Obviously, he succeeded in that. We certainly have become that. Uh, interestingly, uh, he's buried very close to Wall Street. In fact, uh, in a, it's a churchyard that was in the shadow of the, the World Trade Center. The two figures in the middle, at top and bottom, are two presidents of the United States. At the top, we have Thomas Jefferson, who is the third president. At the bottom, we have John Adams, who was the second president. Jefferson was from Virginia. Adams was from Massachusetts. And for much of their lives, they were political rivals. Later on, they became quite friendly, and they had a famous correspondence, which is still preserved, and, and you can go read it. As it turns out, they both died on the same day, which happened to be the, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1826. And then let's look at bottom right, and maybe this is the least recognizable figure, but in still a, a very uh, important person in the history of the United States. This is the great senator and orator Daniel Webster. Now, we're going to learn apportionment methods named for each of these individuals. So we're going to learn the Hamilton method, the Jefferson method, and so on. Also, very briefly, we might learn a little bit about the Hill-Huntington method. This is the one method that's not, in fact, named for any famous historical figure. Uh, this is a table which you might want to come back to and refer to at another time. Also, it should be in the packet of handouts that you've printed for yourself. I want to note that each one of these methods has actually been used historically. At some time, each of these methods was used for apportioning the U.S. House of Representatives, with one exception, namely the Adams method was never used. But now if you look and ask, well, which one's still being used, and in fact it's been used since 1941, it's the Hill-Huntington method, the one that's not associated with any of these famous names. All right, so let's just think about how we would do this ourselves quite naively. So we're going to assume that the census has already been conducted and we know the population of each state. In fact, I'm showing you some of that, beginning with the first state alphabetically, Alabama. Its population at the 2010 census was, as shown there, 4,802,982. And I'm also showing you the last two states, Wisconsin and Wyoming. And because we're in Ohio, I'm also showing you what the population of Ohio was officially in 2010, 11 million and so on. Now, if we add these all up, we get a figure which is called the total apportionment population. It's the total that we're going to work with. Although, let me note, it's not, in fact, the total population of the United States. And the reason is there are certain people that are not 
represented in the House of Representatives, most notably those living in the District of Columbia. Okay, well, we're just going to leave them out because the problem doesn't involve them. And let me also remark that since 1941, the number of seats in the House of Representatives has been fixed. It's 435, and we're always going to assume that, that it's fixed at 435 seats. All right, now, what would you do if you were given this information, okay, you were given the population of each one of the 50 states and you were told you were supposed to assign seats in the House of Representatives with a total of 435. Well, I think probably the first thing you would think to do is, well, let me take the total population or the total apportionment population and divide it by the number of seats. If that's what you're thinking, that's exactly right. So divide the entire population by the number of seats. As we've seen, the relevant population is 309,183,463. We divide it by 435, and rounding off to a whole number, we get 710,767. All right, what is it? Well, we call it the standard divisor, but that doesn't tell you what it means. What does it mean? It means, of course, the average number of people that should be represented by one member of the House of Representatives. It's the average number of people represented. Now, knowing that, we can now ask for each state how many representatives should the state have. And I think everybody, again, will have the same idea. What you should do is you should take the population of whatever state you're considering, let's say Ohio, to be concrete, and divide it by the standard divisor, right? So, for, for example, to use Ohio, you, there are 11,568,495 people, and 710,767 on average are supposed to be represented by one representative. So we divide that, and we get this number 16.276. That should be the number of representatives that Ohio has, 16.276. And that number has a name. It is called the state's standard quota, or simply its quota. The reason we use standard here is that we might, in, come, in fact, come up with other quotas. But if you use what we have called the standard divisor, which is 710,767, and divide into the Ohio's population, you get this standard quota. 16.276. Now, we can take this number, 16.276, which we've said is the number of representatives that Ohio deserves, and we can break it up into a, a whole number plus a fractional part. The fractional part, we simply call the fractional part. The whole number that we get, which in this case is 16, is called the lower quota. Ohio's lower quota is 16. We call it the lower quota because, well, we've gone down, right? We've rounded down. If we would round up, we would round up to 17, so we're going to call that the upper quota. We can do this, of course, for every state. We can get a lower quota and an upper quota. Now, for some states, their population is so small that their lower, qu lower quota will be zero and their upper quota will be one. What we would like to do now is somehow use these calculations of quotas, lower quotas, upper quotas, and fractional parts to determine the apportionment. Now, here are two rules that we must observe. Every state gets at least one representative, and of course, the number of representatives must be a whole number, not a fraction. The first sort of method that we're going to learn about is a quota method. We call it a quota method because it's a method guaranteed to give each state either its lower quota or its upper quota. Now, we're only going to learn one quota method, and that's the method named for Hamilton, Hamilton's method. That is the subject of the next lecture.